Thank you, Irina and Steve, and thank you for joining us today at the PEVC panel. We have a lot to cover today, so let's get started. As I'm sure you've all heard and seen by now, ESG and DEI priorities have been top of mind. Please tell us how these priorities have impacted your business and have prospective and current investors made these conversations part of the fundraising process. Steve, I'll start with you from the LP's perspective, and then we'll move over to Hunter for the GP perspective. Sure. Thanks, Bonnie. Um, I think the first thing to say is, is this really represents one of the silver linings uh, emerging from the pandemic experience. Uh, and, and by that, I mean that there's been a growing focus uh, on and a commitment to um, issues of, of stewardship uh, generally, but, but specifically in the area of ESG and diversity, equity and inclusion. Um, and I think that's incredibly encouraging for the industry because it would have been all too easy to imagine a scenario where these issues might have been pushed aside uh, in favor of prioritizing tactical uh, responses to the pandemic. And that would have been understandable. But this push for a deeper dialogue, uh, creative solutions, it's coming you know, not just from LPs, not just from uh, GPs, but the community as a whole. And I, I think that includes the professional services firms. Uh, that are active in, in our space as well. So it's really been a, a community effort. And I think that's both critically important and, and also a reason to be optimistic uh, about the progress um, that we might be able to, to make here in relatively uh, short order. And on specifically how our LP is taking up these issues, they're addressing it on multiple levels. So they're looking at this within the confines of their own organizations for sure at the GP uh, organizations in which uh, they invest uh, as well, and at the uh, portfolio uh, company level. And that obviously introduces some complexity, but I think it's, it's worth keeping in view that this isn't something that uh, can only be taken up uh, from, through you know, one lens. Uh, and, and how is it impacting the, the ILPA work? Well, I think the simplest way to say is that it, it's featuring uh, prominently both ESG and DE&I. Uh, on our strategic agenda, and that cuts across our efforts on on behalf of LPs, content, education, uh, advocacy, um, and examples specifically uh, that are probably worth mentioning. We have a diversity in action initiative, uh, which launched uh, late last year, somewhere in the range of, of 30 or so uh, signatories. That over a period of just a few months has become a group of, of 200 uh, LPs, GPs, consultants that are getting uh, together on a quarterly basis uh, to discuss these issues, uh, and we uh, released an ESG assessment framework uh, just this summer. So I think you're likely to see much more from us uh, on this front going forward. Thank you, Steve. Hunter, we'll go over to you. Yeah, sure. I think Steve's right. I mean, I think it starts with an awareness, uh, and, and awareness, and with awareness comes perspective. And then I think you have to move into action on those things. And uh, from, from from a Redbird standpoint, it, it does. It starts with your, your broader community, and then it goes into the community that you have at your workplace and the culture you have at your workplace. And for us, since the beginning uh, in 2014, when Redbird was founded, founded in partnership with Ontario Teachers, it's been somewhat of a bedrock for us. It's been something that uh, at times they were leading the target, and at times we were leading the target. And I think uh, as you work together, both with your LPs and then work internally uh, amongst the GP and amongst the culture you're trying to build, uh, if you don't have awareness, you can't make progress on it. And I think that you know, for us, if we look sort of the arc of where we've come at Redbird, you know, today 40% of our 40% uh, of our people are are either uh, diverse, female, or veterans, and that's something we're very proud of. And I think uh, two of our portfolio company CEOs are, are females, and so. You know, it, it's not one thing, it's everything. And I think, uh, it, it, and two, it, it's, it's, it's almost not an LP perspective or a GP perspective. To me, it goes to the perspective that we, we, we must have as humans on where we're going and, and, and what we want to be uh, as we all live together in common humanity. So it, it's somewhat, uh, as a father of a very diverse family with two adoptive children who are African, uh, it's somewhat uh, um, unsettling to me when we talk about these things in, in, in the investor community as if they only apply to the investor community, because they are much broader issues that really should not just matter what, what industry we're in. Now, as industry leaders, we have to set the standard and we have to carry it forward and be an example. But 
it's not just an investor or GP or LP issue. It's an everything issue. And uh, my hope is that it goes across all of our lives, uh, wherever we are. So I do think that as capital providers, we can lead and as leaders, uh, we can we can make examples of, of doing the right things. Thank you. Thank you. So, PV, I want to uh, turn the tables to you right now. Um, so with increased awareness and appetite from investors, how is Coda Capital implementing ESG and DEI priorities? We come at it from a technology lens and we say, okay, what are the right things to do right around not just ESG, um, uh, but also DEI, right? And um, our ability to, um, uh, you know, we, our job is uh, in a big G on the governance side. Uh, you know, we, uh, you know, so someone asked me the other day, you know, if the QSPS um, uh, re regulatory, regulatory changes happen, um, you know, where the significant wealth that's generated, uh, you know, in the VC private equity industry, which is based on QSPS, which is qualified small business stock, gets changed, would it change, would there be less investments? And you know, I just don't believe it, right? We don't make we don't make investments in companies to avoid tax laws. I mean, that's not that's not what we do, right? We're we're here about creating the next billion dollar, trillion dollar enterprise. And um, so, so governance for us is a core part of what we do. Uh, so tax laws, uh, all the regulatory changes that's happening uh, in our around it is a core part of what we do. Um, on the on the social factor side, uh, like we talked about, right, the the, uh, the the S part of the ESG uh, is fundamental to how uh, technology firms are going to uh, have to create uh, a special focus on. You may have recently heard, um, you know, we were talking about it earlier on uh, here with with, uh, with with Hunter and Steve. Um, Facebook knew exactly what it was doing when it bought WhatsApp. Right, and they knew how addictive WhatsApp was going to be, uh, but if you still continue to peddle that to to young impressionable teenagers, right, it doesn't matter what ESG initiatives that you have within your company, your actions directly you know, reflect that, right? As as my colleagues just mentioned, um, you know, and we think that the impact of technology, we have a lot of investments um, in the uh, in the bio and the energy sector. Uh, so the direct involvement around how technology impacts um, climate change, you know, UN efforts, you know, around this, um, we are investing in portfolio companies that make a strong case for how their technology and their practices are going to align with ESG initiatives, not just driven by LPs requirements, but our ability to show that in action uh, is really important for us as well. Thank you, PV. So my next question, I wanna um, give that to Steve. Steve, how are the ESG and DI initiatives tracked and measured by investors? Yeah, the honest answer I think there is, uh, is with difficulty. Um, and and, 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 I, and I, I mean that both from the LP and the GP perspective, and, and this is a place where, where no one is at fault, we're just all finding uh, our way together uh, and, in, and in real time. Um, I would say I think I think it starts with establishing uh, objectives, and, and in many cases, these are still coming um, into focus and, and or being uh, refined. So, what what are we seeking to achieve? And then we can start to have that conversation about what are we measuring and what metrics are we going to use uh, to ultimately make that assessment. And I think that's part of the reason why you see LPs today looking not just for for data, but to understand uh, the policies. Uh, that GPs uh, have in place that they can rely on over time to help ground uh, and guide those efforts uh, as it relates to ESG uh, and DE&I. And, and I would just underline the point that those two things have to continue uh, to come uh, together. Uh, and there needs to be a shared appreciation for the fact that we are, we are on a journey uh, and there are going to be starts and stops along the way. What really matters is that there's a rich and robust dialogue uh, that's in place that is going to get us to a point where we can feel good about the the, the frameworks that we're using and, and the metrics that uh, we're reporting on. But definitions really matter uh, with these uh, issues, and data can be difficult to collect, obviously, 
Uh, and, and the reality is that I think, you know, this complicates and frustrates uh, efforts even um, for those with the, the best of, of intentions. Um, but we, we are, uh, I would say, unequivocally on a one-way uh, street here. Uh, and ESG and, and de and I are, are no longer add-ons uh, or an afterthought in any way um, for LPs. And, and many organizations, maybe most organizations, are, are now taking these factors into consideration as a part of their uh, investment decision and really a, a, a core um, decision point for any uh, investment decision. So you're going to see more of uh, these questions uh, feature in due diligence. Uh, questionnaires and uh, data templates uh, and the like. Th that information exchange needs to continue to become uh, more consistent and, and more meaningful. And again, that that is a two-way street. Uh, LPs need to um, help GPs provide the, that right information, need to be clear about uh, what they're asking for uh, and why. And hopefully that leads us to a place where we can establish uh, a standard set of metrics. Um, it really does represent a precondition, I think, for the industry to, to move forward in any uh, meaningful way here. Encouragingly, there are some initiatives that are already in, in flight that do bring together uh, that GP and LP uh, perspective. And you, can, you can see some of those compromises uh, happening in real time. You can also see folks uh, acknowledging that perfect is going to be the enemy of the good here. Um, and, I, and I think what, what we'll find is those industry-led solutions are going to be um, the best possible outcome uh, for us, as opposed to a, a rigid you know, regulatory uh, mandate uh, being posed, which will happen uh, if we, uh, as an industry, aren't able to um, move this thing forward with, uh, with pace. So I, I think you only uh, continue to see more discussion, more data. The hope is that we don't uh, end up at the, uh, at the end of this with 15 competing frameworks and a whole range of definitions and um, and solutions that don't track across markets or across across strategies. That 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 sort of tangle um, will be a major uh, impediment for uh, for all involved. Thank you. So perfect is the enemy of good. I am taking that line because I love it. Um, so Hunter. How is Redbird Capital tracking and measuring ESG and DEI initiatives from the GP perspective? Uh, so I would second what Steve said. Perfect is the enemy of good, and, and this is an evolution. I mean, I, it, I've been doing this almost 20 years, and certainly, uh, you know, 15 years ago, we were not having these kind of conversations. So I think the evolution maybe needs to be accelerated, but at least we have begun the journey. I mean, if you think about Redbird from a dedicated, from, from a, from a, Redbird, how are we approaching it? How do we track and measure it? We have a dedicated deal team uh, that focuses on ESG and DNI across the portfolio. So, you know, whether that's an underwriting or whether that's ongoing, we have uh, three to four individuals in the firm who that is their job, uh, including one partner to ensure that that overlay uh, is, ac is across the portfolio. And then certainly for our more uh, uh, ESG sensitive businesses that may be uh, natural resource oriented. You know, e each company prepares sustainability reports, and we track things on a very granular basis on metrics that can be measured, such as uh, you know greenhouse gas uh, reductions and whatnot. So, where, where there are fine tuned stats that we can closely monitor, we do that. You know, as Steve said, it, it's it's hard sometimes to define everything and to track everything as we're on this. So, uh, what we try to do is. is uh, is 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 really focus on the good and not not worry about being perfect, frankly, because I think as we have these conversations with LPs, LPs right now it is a conversation. It's not a uh, it, it's a, harder to do a scorecard uh, because uh, it, it, as PV said, you know what what belies underneath the scorecard, maybe the actions are different. So what we're trying to do is make sure that our overall philosophy is driven by uh, the the journey where we want to be on versus uh, maybe just pure statistics here and there. Thank you, everyone, for your perspective on ESG and DEI. Let's now turn over to investment sector. Um, so coming out of the pandemic, which sectors do you think will be the recipient of significant PE or VC capital over the next 12 to 18 months? Uh, PV, I'll start with you. Oh, thank you. Um, you know, as, as, as we uh, chatted earlier, um, you know, we are a U.S.-based 
uh, B2B enterprise technology investment firm. Uh, the fundamental belief is that our, our businesses are going to be digitally powered um, and the digital transformation uh, has um, almost accelerated uh, at, at, uh, at warp speed, uh, you know, post COVID and, and the digital transformation that we've been talking about it, you know, for 10 years, literally happened in 10 weeks. And so, uh, so a big part of our, uh, of, of our delivery, right. Of, of how we think about investments are areas where, um, the, the context of not only the shifting geopolitical, um, you know, issues, um, uh, especially as it relates to, uh, to China and Europe, um, and, and, uh, kind of the post COVID complexities, uh, really have driven a new way of thinking about our specific investments. Um, so the one area uh, that I would highlight is we think there's going to be a rebirth or renaissance of the semiconductor industry here, because we have a, sh a very severe, uh, chip shortage, uh, you know, in this, in this country. And we relied on just one, one main source to get access to, uh, to, to silicon based chips. So we, we think, uh, we need to take our head out of the sand and head back into silica, uh, as I, as I, as I say it, uh, and start creating foundries and start making chips in the United States. Um, and, and we, and, and we talked about AI, AI systems are now being embedded inside of chips now. So we can do faster processing, faster voice recognition, faster facial recognition, and so on. So it's a fundamental game changer for us to think about, you know, just a simple thing of bringing semiconductor uh, manufacturing and design back uh, to the United States. Thank you, PV. Um, Hunter, I would like to ask you the same question. I certainly think that the pandemic both created dislocation and acceleration, as PV said. And I think that... Um, you know, if you look at one of Redbird's core sectors, which is sports and the ecosystem of sports, uh, we made a number of investments over the last 12 months in the sports sector that uh, may, maybe I would say most of those were accelerated because of the pandemic uh, and, and really the opportunity for growth. So it wasn't so much rescue as it was enabling growth at a quicker pace than maybe what it was contemplated as the underlying industry and underlying trends transform quicker than maybe what was anticipated. So I think the sports ecosystem, uh, which is a big part of what Redbird does, uh, really had a lot of interesting things happen and present a lot of investment opportunities that it's had been, uh, you know, been in the hopper, if you will, as you know, deals take time, but maybe uh, accelerated the opportunity. So I would say that's one. And then Certainly on, on the telecommunication side and the digital transformation as well, uh, I think that there are a host of opportunities there that uh, we've invested in and will continue to see uh, as the world just, just migrates at a quicker pace. So the, the proliferation of ones and zeros is going to continue. Uh, and, and as PV said, whether it's, it's infrastructure or applications, both are needed to solve, uh, to solve problems. Thank you. So PV, speaking of deal activity, we saw that healthcare and technology have been very popular. What's the sector that no one is talking about? You know, like I mentioned earlier, I think semiconductor is probably, uh, you know, the one that people, uh, you know, have overlooked. The second one I would add is uh, what I would call additive manufacturing or kind of what's popularly known as kind of 3D printing. Um, it's, it's something that, uh, again, coming back to the supply chain and parts uh, and materials issue, there's tremendous amount of research uh, as well as um, uh, technology innovation that's happening in material science uh, in the United States. So it's new ways of, of uh, uh, you know, of creating, you know, sort of value, uh, you know, in, in um uh, you know, in the in the clothes that we wear, right, that are more, uh, you know, environmentally friendly to uh, materials that, uh, you know, reduce the use of plastics, uh, for example, uh, and so on. So material science is, is another, you know, I think a really, really cool growth area. Thank you, PV. Um, it has been reported that there is a record high of $950 billion of dry powder in North America, which created a very competitive deal environment. How can a co-investment partner support ongoing operations and value creation, 
Steve, I'll start with you on this one. Sure, and I'll uh, I'll, I'll defer to, to Hunter on sort of the specifics of, of what a, a, a general partner is looking for uh, in that co-investment partner, but 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 maybe just in more general terms, it's worth saying that the, the appetite for co-investment opportunities from from LPs remains very strong. That has not been dented at all uh, by the past uh, year and a half, and. I think that's both because of the potential to to enhance returns, but it does have to be said that you know part of the effort there is to reduce uh, overall uh, fees um, as well. So I think one of the challenges that that we've seen uh, amongst LPs that are looking to do more in the uh, co-investment space is how to uh, retool and or add to uh, their investment teams in ways that allow for a different sort of uh, diligence process, uh, the compressed timelines that are are often in place. So how do you build out specific skill sets are going to allow you uh, to do this type of investing even more uh, effectively. The other point, which I think is occasionally lost in the conversation, is you have to ensure that that overarching governance structure uh, can support um, the decision making that that's required, that that um, uh, that that mechanism is in place. And that's often uh, different, requires some sort of modification evolution uh, in order for the governance structure to really be there. Uh, for the investment uh, process to, to take hold. I'd also say that most of the LPs that are really participating in co-investments in a, in a strategic way are looking to be more than just providers of, of capital. And so they would like to be a value-added partner. Uh, they look to their, uh, their networks, which might be additive uh, in, in a particular situation. Uh, perhaps their portfolio uh, includes the possibility of, of really sort of leveraging existing investments uh, to help support uh, a new uh, investment. And in some cases, there's real domain expertise uh, that's resident uh, with an LP, whether through the individuals that are involved um, in the investment and or sort of the broader organization and, and its history and, and other activities. And so obviously LPs come in a variety of, of shapes, sizes, and, and types, but there, it's certainly the case that there are some LPs that are far more um, than just providers of, of capital. And I think you know, more and more are looking to figure out how can they be uh, a genuine value-added uh, partner uh, to the GPs that they're, they're uh, engaging with. Hunter, I think Steve called your name for your perspective on this. So let's, let's get your opinion. No, I think Steve's right. I mean, some of it comes down to uh, how is the LP equipped? Do they have the team or, or are they accustomed to being allocators of capital versus you know, working on a deal and underwriting one particular investment on a compressed timeline with pressure where, you know, frankly, uh, you don't know the answer. <laughs> if you knew the answer, uh, you, you, you sort of you would be seeing into the future. So being comfortable only having 80 percent of something, I mean, that's to me, that's the biggest difference between. You know, when someone sits as an allocator, they're underwriting the manager, they're looking at, at their past performance, the philosophy, do they sync on where what their investment strategy is, versus when you're underwriting a deal and having to make judgments on the fly with less than perfect information. So there, there are two different skill sets. And I think we're, what we appreciate with some of our co-investors, and we've had an awful lot of co-investment uh, over the last seven years in our fund, the, the, the ones that... Uh, Sort of the first one is the hardest with a co-investor. And once you get one done and you've walked the road before, two, three, four, five are much easier. And so uh, I can recall our first co-investment. Uh, it was very difficult. We thought, why aren't we doing this? We should never do this again. And this is, you know, uh, but over time, some of our larger co-investment partners, we really have figured out the right cadence. And so I think the first one's always the hardest, and then you then you begin to figure out and have the right cadence together as you walk the road. But what we enjoy the most is when someone is uh, comes out of from a true investor mindset. They're willing to dive into the data room. They're 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 not looking just to read a report. They they realize that you may read a report, but then you have to start making judgments around the investment, uh, and that's what we really appreciate. We're going to switch over to technology now. So PV, we'll start with you. How have PE or VC firms been transformed by technology in recent years? And which parts of the businesses do you see being changed by technology in the next few years? In a lot of ways, um, you know, the private equity uh, and the venture capital world, uh, in some sense, are like uh, the cobbler's kid, uh, you know, with 
you know, with the children with no shoes. Uh, but we invest in technology all day long, uh, uh, you know, and I, and I see my colleagues here shaking their heads. Um, but, but it's about to get shaken up uh, quite dramatically. You know, we see at, at one end of the spectrum, uh, you know, uh, some really, uh, you know, incredible firms like, uh, you know, EQT and, and, and Tiger um, that uh, basically use data and data science and large quantities of data science engineers that compute data literally across the past 20 years uh, uh, kind of company and company performance, um, as well as all the funding that's, that's happening in our industry uh, today. And, um, and algorithms and systems are now telling them which ones they should prioritize first and which one has the highest chance for getting to a billion dollars in revenues so everything is driven today um you know through uh, better data better information better analytics uh and, and and therefore better decisions um now algorithmic trading and and things that leverage uh um you know kind of high, high compute has been very common in the hedge fund world um you know they've been using technology for years now but the private equity world uh, is, is truly awash in data. There's one thing that we have is data um, and, and company performance. Uh, less so perhaps on the private side, but that's changing as well. Uh, and, you know, so even venture debt providers today can literally write you a $5 million check within 30 minutes um, with companies just uploading their financials. And you can make decisions on getting a $5 million credit, uh, if you'd like, because they've got algorithms built into these systems today. So while we invest in um, leading edge uh, and cutting edge sort of technologies, the private equity firms are now becoming incredibly sophisticated as well in how they do their, their data collection, the data, data curation, the data analytics, uh, as well as the decision-making that powers them. Uh, so it's we're fundamentally, fundamentally being disrupted uh, in, in very unique ways that's going to uh, hopefully sustain the industry. Thank you. Now, Steve, uh, your opinion on this topic? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll take just a slightly different uh, tact on this. And I, I would agree with everything that uh, that, that PV has, uh, has just shared. And, and, and maybe from the, from the LP um, uh, perspective, they see the technology um, that's being developed and deployed uh, by the portfolio companies in their private markets portfolio to PV's point, how, how that's unlocking, you know, efficiencies, enabling growth, creating amazing value. Um, and then they look at the technology that they rely on internally and to be diplomatic, you know, can't help um, but see just a massive gap uh, in terms of uh, agility, sophistication, et cetera. Uh, and we, we actually ran, ILPA ran a, a targeted LP technology survey last year, and the results, unfortunately, weren't, weren't a huge surprise. So only a quarter uh, of the LPs that responded were, were satisfied with their current technology tools. And, and the vast majority reported uh, that manual interventions, uh, legacy data and, and systems integration, and just their internal capacity uh, to evaluate um, new solutions were, were primary. Uh, pain points, and those have been around now for a while. So that that leap from just being able to do things a, a little bit easier to everything that that PV rightfully points to in terms of massive uh, analytical capacity and 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 what that can do uh, for decision making, it just it still feels a long way off uh, for for most uh, LPs. I, I would say on the on the flip side of that coin, however. Um, you know, obviously, uh, technology has been a, a tremendous uh, equalizer uh, for the industry over the past couple of years, and everything related to that shift, that 10-week shift that BV mentioned of, of moving to virtual interactions and remote operations, you know, that could have brought us to a screeching uh, halt. But in many ways, I think that is both up to the game for uh, LPs in terms of how they manage uh, their operations internally, but also improved uh, the LPGP dynamic. So folks being more accessible, uh, more touch points, information sharing that's been, you know, even, even better, uh, more robust, higher quality, um, and more folks being able to, 
be brought into those conversations on, on, on both sides. You know, that bodes well for the industry as a whole. So we've, we've had um, a number of professionals, and again, I know this holds true across the, the GPLP spectrum, that have been able to participate in different ways earlier uh, in their careers, gotten that exposure, learned some lessons, and, and, and that, that experience will be, you know, I think, really valuable um, and, and put to good use here. Uh, for years to come. So technology from, you know, the portfolio standpoint, incredible opportunity set from the internal operating uh, perspective, a massive pain point and, you know, looking ahead to the future from an organizational development um, perspective, lots of reason to be, you know, to be optimistic. Thank you, Steve. So that concludes all our questions. Hunter, Steve, PV, thank you so much for taking some time out of your busy schedules to share your views with us. And thank you for joining us today at the PEVC panel.